you folks hear me? Sorry, I think I was muted. Okay, so let oh, me try again. Okay. Yes. We are recording. Um, uh, this is the penultimate spring meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. We hold research talks uh, bi-weekly, and today it's our honor to have Dr. Peter Peterson from the University of Minnesota Duluth speak on adversarial thinking. Uh, Dr. Peterson and I worked together um, on the CATS project, Cyber Security Assessment Tools, where we've developed two concept inventories for cybersecurity concepts. And uh, uh, Dr. Peterson um, is going to be talking about defining um, adversarial thinking and uh, his work towards a non technical concept inventory specifically for adversarial thinking. We share uh, an interest in adversarial thinking because um, I, we consider it to be the core of, of cybersecurity. So welcome, Dr. Peterson. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate um, being able to be here and uh, everybody who's come to hear me talk about this. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, definitely a work in progress for me. This is not uh, the kind of a talk uh, where reporting on uh, the results of a, of a long study. It's more a talk about um, what I'm working on, what I'm excited about right now, what I'm thinking about um, towards future future uh, research. Um, I'm hoping it will be a pretty interactive talk. I'm going to set a timer here so I can keep an eye on where things are at, but there are some places where um, I'll ask for your thoughts or responses or ideas. Um, because like I said, this is uh, something that I'm interested in, something I'm working on, but also um, something where getting the community's feedback, I think is really important. Now, for Linux, um, I've never actually tried to screen share before. So let me see how that works. Um, if it fails, I may need to ask someone else to present the slides. So I'm... You have the slides on the screen and then you click on share and then you choose which screen you want to share. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Um, select window or screen adversarial thinking. Oh, I see. Okay. Can you see the slides? Yes. Perfect. And I'm going to, um, it turns out that it starts to flake out. Um, you guys can let me know and I'll disable my camera. Otherwise, I will go um, go ahead. I'm actually right. getting a blank screen now, a black screen. Oh. Can anybody see the slides? Just I cannot. Screen. Although I can reload. Okay. Did you did you click on the right screen? Where, click on the word share. I did. Let me try this again. My my screen seems to say that it's working. Um, I'll try a different. If you email me the slides, I can present them. Or if you're using Firefox, you click on the share Firefox. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah, it Webex says that it's sharing the screen, but um, if you're just seeing a blank. Well, it says Peter Pedersen is sharing, is starting to share content, dot, dot, dot. Here, I'll, I'll turn off my video. That may help. I, we have a terrible uh, uplink here. I mean, Peter, why don't you simultaneously email me the slides? Sure, there's a link to the slides um, in the chat. It's a Google presentation, so you can see it right there. I tried to put a bunch of links in the slides as well um, so people can see the, the types of stuff I'm looking at. Is it still blank for you, folks? 
Yes, it's still blank here. Okay, let me try one more thing. Um, I'm sorry. I, I'm we're a Zoom shop, and so uh, I have all these things worked out for Zoom, but um, unfortunately not for WebEx. Okay, I'm going to try to just open this as a PDF, and I'll share try to share the PDF application instead. All right. Is that working? No. OK. Oh, well, uh, why don't you let me uh, share it, Peter? Yep, that would be great, Alan. Thank you. Um, only one person can share at a time, I yep. think. I stopped sharing. Just say next slide when you want me to advance. Sure, will do. <clears throat> uh, you can uh, skip the title page. Um, go back one, please. So uh, adversarial thinking is the, the topic for today, and I will um, jump right into it since we're uh, running a little behind. Um, a lot of people talk about this as thinking like an attacker or thinking like a hacker. Um, sometimes um, people describe it as security thinking or the security mindset. Um, and it's this idea that's kind of widely thought anecdotally to be kind of the secret sauce of uh, information security practice, right? So if you have this ability, you're, you could be good at um, doing security practice. If you don't have this ability, um, maybe you won't be good at um, solving security problems or, or being a, a security professional. Um, you know, people, when they talk about it, they say, oh, is this something innate that people have? Um, is this something that could be taught? Um, you know, broader questions like that. Um, but unfortunately, there's no widely accepted definition. Um, and of course, uh, therefore, we can't test for it. We can't really do science about it. Um, and so I think adversarial thinking is important. I mean, I believe in the idea of adversarial thinking. Um, and so my goals is I'd like to work towards an accepted definition of what is adversarial What are at least uncontroversial things that we can agree are examples of adversarial thinking? If you think about it from an educator's perspective, you know, I, I can't teach you everything there is to learn about security in a class, but I can make my objectives for the class. And what are the things that I want you to be able to do to demonstrate, um, you know, learning of the material? And so. Peter, you're muted. I'm muted. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, boy. I've been muted this whole time. And for about a minute. Weird. Uh, OK. I'm so sorry. Um, I don't eat. Weird. Uh, from when did it? Was I talking and then it muted itself? It was for this slide. OK. Um, Let's just skip ahead then. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't really know how that happened. But um, how do we talk about adversarial thinking in the community? Um, things like the idea of the principle of easiest penetration or path of least resistance. Um, we say things like, don't think about how it works. Think about how it can fail. Um, you know, what's the worst input this program could get? Um, I, I tell my students, security is the only contact sport in computer science or you know, you have to think of secure programming as programming Satan's computer, somebody who is, you know, um, nefarious and smart and powerful. What, how would you write a program to, to defeat that? Or um, the, the quote, you know, you don't have to uh, be paranoid to, to be good at security, but it helps and so on. Right. Um, can you people uh, do people have any other like pithy examples of what adversarial thinking is? 
you can either put that in the chat or um, out loud. Of adversarial thinking? Yeah. So so of the types of phrases or, or short, pithy descriptions. Because um, when people say, think like an attacker, it's not really clear what that means, right? That's like anecdotally um, an, an attractive thing. But what does that mean? Um, so I have a, it's a thing that I always think to myself, which is, I always assume the attacker is way smarter than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. I love the quote. Um, I think it's Kerningan who said, you know, uh, debugging is twice as hard as writing code in the first place. So if you write code as cleverly as possible, uh, it's by definition, you're not smart enough to debug it. Um, yeah, I, I like to see Sun Tzu here. Uh, to know your enemy, you must become your enemy. That's perfect. In the, exactly. In the, in the cyber dogs, uh, when we're doing our competitions, generally it's common knowledge that if everything seems fine, that's way more scary than if, if things are falling apart. <laughs> I like that. Um uh, Andrew says, on the global scale, think of the objectives of the adversary in terms of intelligence, denial, or manipulation. I like that. Um, okay, uh, let's move on um, just for time um, and say, uh, next slide. So uh, do, do people in the security community really think that, um, that security is important? Um, and yes, they do, uh, I would argue. Um, a lot of quotes here. Uh, I'm not going to read all of them, but but you can read them. And there are links to the papers um, where these come from, right? So um, a lot of people saying adversarial thinking is really the core of what we want to teach people when we're teaching cybersecurity, right? Um, think about uh, you have to be able to switch to the attacker's way of thinking. Um, Bruce Schneier talks about it as a particular mindset or a, a way of seeing the world. And, and that's something that I'll come back to towards the end, um, where we're, we're not talking about something that applies only within the context of cybersecurity, but it seems to be a, a way of thinking that people can apply um, in other walks and areas of life. Um, next slide, there's some more uh, quotes. Um, necessary for defense, foundational to security engineering. Um, it's a part of the 2017 ACM cybersecurity curricula as one of their um, cross-cutting uh, topics. Um, so it, of course, I, I threw in a, a link to a Dr. Shannon and the CATS project where um, their Delphi process found that um, adversarial thinking was a, a core issue in cybersecurity. And we'll actually return to that idea. Um, people make um, educational interventions to try to improve cybersecurity. So uh, next slide, please. Excuse me, I'm getting over a, a cold. Um, <clears throat> so uh, several games have been made. Um, the first two are tabletop games, Control-Alt-Hack and Doxed. Um, not me, Peterson, but a different one. Um, there's a, a great paper um, by uh, Conti and Carolind. Uh, I believe um, Andrew knows um, uh, Mr. Carolind. I, I don't know what his rank is. Um, but uh, that paper, Embracing the Kobayashi Maru, is a fabulous, fun read. Um, Kat and Carolind, thank you. Um, and if you haven't read it, please go and read it after this talk. It basically is an assignment in a security class to force to, to require students to memorize a hundred digits of pi uh, and re and produce them for a test. Okay, with the idea being that um, you know actually memorizing that is going to be difficult, and so what you should do is cheat. They're you know directly instructed to cheat, but try not to get caught. Okay, and so having to think, well, how would I do that in a classroom? think adversarially about how, you know, given we are given permission or the students are given permission to think adversarially to kind of break those ethics and norms that would normally keep them from even considering those possibilities. Um, and I think that's uh, an important part of adversarial thinking is 
as a good person, right, stepping outside of the constraints that we live in and society and thinking about ways um, to, to break things. Um, Build It, Break It, Fix It by Vatipka uh, is a, uh, and others is a, a project where people design uh, software, break the software and try to fix it in a kind of competitive environment. Um, do this and nothing more is something I've been working on in, with my students that's sort of like a build it, break it, fix it light. And I'm going to uh, revisit that on the next slide. So I'm going to um, not talk about it right now. Um, Seth Hammond, uh, who we'll return to, talked about bringing game theory into a computer science, uh, computer security class to try to get people to think about things from the attacker's perspective. Um, ethical hacking. Uh, my friend Vahab Pornagspand, uh when he teaches CS1, he has students write the login program, right? It's a simple program, um, but it has security impact. And so thinking about how do the, the failures that CS1 students uh, experience when writing a program like this affect security and get them to thinking about them. And of course, Dr. Sherman and crew are working on Meeting Mayhem right now, which is a game explicitly designed to help students think adversarially about um, network communication protocols. And probably many of you uh, are very familiar with it. Um, so people spend a lot of time and effort trying to make these um, interventions. Okay, um, next slide and I'll talk about uh, DTANUM. So DTANUM is a project that I'm working on um, and it the, the short nutshell version of this, and you can come back and look at it or, or ask me questions later, um, but it's a competitive um, bug finding and fixing game. Um, so you can do this in a class. Um, basically, students get a specification for a very simple program, like a command line program uh, calculator, um, and a buggy implementation. Um, and so um, each team has a, starts with the same base, and they look for problems in the implementation by providing an input. Um, and any input that they submit to the game framework is applied to every team's implementation. So for example, if the, the calculator can't do divide by zero, you make some divide by zero arithmetic and everyone starts failing those tests. Um, and so as you patch your own program, you start beating tests and people find new flaws and so on and so forth. And the team that uh, is um, beating the most or passing the most tests by the end of the time period is the winner. And of course, people start thinking adversarially about this, right? Um, they will do things like submitting, um, you know, a million versions of a, uh, per permutations on a particular flaw, right? So if uh, they can't pass a particular uh, alternative uh, opponent can't pass a particular test, then they're going to be way behind, right? Um, and it's always fun. Um, the way we do grading is we have our perfect version of the game. And so, of course, sometimes people find bugs in that, and then we have to fix them in real time. But um, this is a, a fun thing that we're working on uh, and hope to do more uh, with later. But um, that's one of our adversarial thinking tools. Um, Dr. Sherman, if you could um, go through two slides, because the, the second one is uh, sort of an animation. Um, so there is no widely accepted definition of AT, right? So it's this thing that everybody thinks is really important. We put a lot of time and effort into talking about and creating exercises for, but there is no definition. Uh, next slide, please. So if we can't be specific about it, then of course we can't test it. Um, we can't answer those questions. There are some people just good at it. Can we teach people if we can, um, how good are various uh, interventions about it? And so we can't be scientific about it. And that actually makes a whole area of security education research really difficult because it, it's hard to propose um, creating new interventions for improving um, adversarial thinking or finding out who has it or how important it is um, when you can't evaluate it, right? And so that's the the thing that I kept running into um, that made me say, hey, maybe what we can do is come up with um, a definition for adversarial thinking or even some core components of adversarial thinking and make a test for that. And then we can start using it um, for research. Next slide, please. A couple of people have proposed some, some definitions or something that's beyond 
um, think like an attacker, right, as an anecdote. Um, so um, Fred Schneider in 2013 um, talked about game theory, mentioned game theory, um, and uh, how identifying possible actions is sort of the central challenge in adversarial thinking. And uh, Melissa Dark and Yelena Mirkovic um, had a, a, a similar but uh, slightly a different version of that, again, on understanding, exploiting, and subverting rules, but then also finding ways to modify the space, which uh, to me is ways of creating and changing rules, right? So um, exploiting and subverting rules, but then also um, creating new rules, changing rules, taking rules away. Next slide, please. Um, Seth Hammond, um, in his thesis, um, I think he was at the Air Force Institute of Technology when he did that. Um, and the paper linked there is with Hopkinson, um, focuses on um, adversarial thinking with game theory through a particular theory of intelligence called Sternberg's triarchic theory. And Sternberg's triarchic theory brings which is sort of mathematics, logical. Um, create thinking you need create, uh, connections seeing different possibilities and then the practical which is sort of putting those things into practice right planning strategizing um i'll come back to this a little bit later but um i i like this um, articulation and i think it's interesting and thought-provoking um but i have a couple concerns one is that um i don't really want to tie uh a definition or descriptions of adversarial thinking to a particular theory of intelligence that, you know, um, may uh, wax and wane in popularity. Um, I also think that things like analytical skills, while um, important and, and, and you know, central if you're going to put intelligence into three categories, um, analytical, mathematical, logical, you know, skills, those are sort of a precursor, I think, to, um, to adversarial thinking, not necessarily a core component of it. And then um, with practical, uh, anytime you think about adversarial thinking or, or uh, that sort of idea, strategy kind of becomes the next obvious step. But when we look back at how the community talks about adversarial thinking, the descriptions of examples of adversarial thinking are not usually at the strategic level, right? They're not thinking two, three, four, five, six steps down the road. They're usually talking about people's ability to look at a situation and do that creative step. At least that's my argument. Um, making those unique connections, seeing possibilities. Um, those are the core ideas of the previous um, definition attempts. And so that uh, tends to be what I'm focusing on. Um, and one more slide, please. We'll talk about the CATS project. So. The CATS project didn't set out, uh, at least to my understanding, this is before I was involved, um, didn't start out with the goal of defining adversarial thinking, um, but adversarial thinking in the discussions of what should be on a concept inventory for cybersecurity. Uh, and a concept inventory is a test that uh, evaluates whether students understand core concepts of a particular topic uh, in the process of developing those topics, adversarial thinking became clearly a, a really important um, aspect of it. And so the, the five concepts that came out of their expert consensus process, which is called the Delphi study, you can read about it more if you're interested, um, are the following. Identify vulnerabilities and failures. Identify attacks against CIA and authentication. Devise a defense. Identify security goals and identify potential targets and attackers. And to me, when I look at this list um, and I think about adversarial thinking as a broader concept, um, what I see is a number of these are really talking about seeing possibilities again, you know, see vulnerabilities in a system or ways that things could fail, um, see attacks that could happen, um, um, see ways to create a defense, um, see what the goals are and so on. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, next slide, please. So um, once again, uh, there isn't a widely accepted definition, and there aren't really that many people who have set about trying to, to say, this is what I think adversarial thinking is. Um, 
And again, uh, if we had such a definition, we could do science uh, with it. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to um, take a, a quick step off to the side here and talk about computational thinking briefly. Um, and if we were in a classroom, I'd say, how many of you have um, heard of computational thinking as an idea? That's kind of hard to do in the Zoom world. Um, so I'll, I'll skip that. But the basic idea of computational thinking, um, people really started to talk about about 15 years ago. And that's the idea of saying, you know, how can we teach people to think about things algorithmically, to decompose problems, um, to uh, organize and, and, and pattern match, organize data and pattern match and so on. Um, and if we could do that, we could help people um, solve problems. Uh, it's closely related to um, critical thinking skills and algorithmic um, program writing and things like that. Um, same kind of idea, right? Got a lot of enthusiasm behind it. It's um, intuitively attractive. If we could define it, we could teach it, test it, evaluate it, just the kind of things that I'm talking about. Um, and there are a number of different candidate approaches for um, what we call adversarial thinking or trying to say this is, ad or I'm sorry, computational thinking. This is what computational thinking is and, and outside of that is not. But after about 15 years, um, people have not come to consensus about that. Um, you know, so the major issues, again, of what is or isn't um, computational thinking isn't something that people agree about. For example, some things that are called com components of computational thinking, for example, problem decomposition, are also sort of just general purpose um, things that, that people do in, in critical thinking or other uh, types of problem solving. Um, and so one thing that I've run into when I talk to people about adversarial thinking and about my, my goal is they say, well, how can you avoid the pitfalls of um, the computational thinking project um, that's valuable? I like it and I, I think it's valuable, but, but it hasn't turned out quite the way people had hoped. Next slide, please. So for me, um, the way that I want to try to do that is by identifying um, the essence of AT uh, that's described by the cybersecurity community. So um, not trying to look at what is a comprehensive definition of everything that is and is not adversarial thinking, but again, going back to that idea of what is something or what are some things that um, no one denies uh, are adversarial thinking, right? And and starting by looking at what are the anecdotes that the security community talks about when they talk about adversarial thinking? Um, how do people write about adversarial thinking? What have they said? And then also look at other descriptions of adversarial thinking in other contexts. So military, legal, politics, um, games. Um, see what's f similar between those fields um, because it seems like there's overlap, right? Um, but also focus on what's unique about adversarial thinking within a cybersecurity context, okay? Um, any questions so far? I, I've been kind of blasting through these slides because I got a late start. Um, but any questions or comments or um, anything so far? All right, well, let's move on. Yeah, um, I, um, oh, go I ahead. have a question. Um, Please. So about computational thinking, uh, might there be another aspect of that that maybe hasn't been uh, emphasized much, which is software engineering thinking? Because in software engineering, I think you have to worry about what could go wrong. Yep. I mean, um, what, what might our user do, do that we don't expect? Yes. Um, so I think that's a great point um and and it's something that i i have been trying to think about um and i haven't quite found the way that i want to articulate that but you know there's that common thing that comes up where people say oh well if you know we built software or if we build bridges the way we build software you know that they, they'd be falling down all the time and, and all of that and so one of the things that i i am trying to think about is why is it that it's so much harder it seems um, or so much harder to model um, the adversary in the computer world versus 
you know, normally we don't think about adversaries and bridges, um, except maybe in a, in a military context. We do think about, you know, wind forces and degradation of materials and all of those kinds of things that engineers have been able to essentially model um, and then build into the design of their systems. And we haven't quite done that with um, software engineering. And I'm not sure if that's, I, I would, I'm just speculating here, but I think that's probably partly because the field is so young, um, relatively, um, and partly because the adversary is so unconstrained, um, as opposed to what we consider the, the adversaries of a bridge, so to speak. Um, but I do think um, there is a, a relationship between kind of adversarial thinking and engineering thinking. Um, but in to make a really short answer, people haven't talked about engineering thinking as a as a movement in the same way that um, they talk about adversarial thinking as an essential aspect of security or computational thinking as this project that's been going on for about 15 years. Other thoughts or comments? Well, just to follow up, uh, yeah. it, it makes me think of my one of my favorite uh, ideas, the uh, idea of a chaos monkey that Netscape introduced years ago to test their user interfaces, uh, which would be a program that would just try all kinds of random stuff in the user interface to see if anything blew up. Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> so that's maybe a little bit more like the engineering uh, approach. Uh, yes, uh, I, I like that too. So the the chaos monkey um, and and the, the mo more modern kind of fuzzing ideas, right? Um, so what's interesting about that to me from an adversarial perspective is um uh at least naive fuzzing is pretty random right and it, and it maybe it will hit upon um a, a vulnerability at, at some point and surely they will um but they also might not because of the space of possibilities and so many uh possibilities for that monkey or a fuzzer just don't do anything interesting um, and so in fuzzing actually the the modern fuzzers uh, like AFL, actually try to get um, code coverage and coverage over the program, uh, finding inputs that exercise different areas of the program and so on, um, which is, I think, more in towards that engineering um, thinking idea, which is, uh, I really like that. Um, Naomi says, uh, this, is my, this is what I do in my classes. I feel like a, a late night um, radio DJ, you know, uh, well, I've got a call from, from Omaha. Naomi says, I think human adversaries are constantly evolving, but wind degradations and materials are fairly static and easily modeled. I completely agree with that. Um, uh, that that's sort of like the quote, um, attacks only get better, right? But, you know, concrete uh, is kind of its own thing, right? Um, and, it, and it doesn't really change. Um, Ennis says, securing a bridge against certain kinds of adversaries would be difficult as well. Yeah, and I agree. Um, but I think that's almost a an example of how um, it's like the exception that proves the rule, right? Like in their day-to-day -day lives, we're not concerned with adversaries of bridges, right? Um, and, and once we start to do that, you know, think in a post 9-11 world or, you know, what have you, suddenly things get really complicated because we're not really sure how to do that. Um, and so I think that's an argument for how in a traditional engineering um, field, the, the problem scope is smaller. And I don't mean that in a pat ourselves on the back way, because obviously from a security perspective, we're not doing that great. Um, but I think in some ways it's a simpler problem. Um, sports is another great idea, Dr. Sherman, which I will totally look into. Um, let's, uh, uh, next slide, please. So let's look at some anecdotes from the community um, describing adversarial thinking. So um, Bruce Schneier, uh, the, the anecdotes that he brings up that are really the ones that most people um, tend to bring up are um, Uncle Milton's ants for the ant farms. Everybody, you know, ever wondered, well, how long do the ants live on the shelf um, and at Target? Uh, well, they're not in the ant farm. What you get in the ant farm is a little card that you fill out, and then Uncle Milton will ship you a tube of live ants. Um, and of course, um, Bruce Schneier's response is when he first learned that, he said, oh, so you, you mean I can send ants to anybody? 
um, which is the same thing that my friend discovered when he got his first um, beehive, right? It comes with a card for bees. Um, and apparently you can also order bed bugs for research, um, but that website claims they verify who they send the bed bugs to. And Bruce Schneier also talks about smart water, which was this kind of isotope water spray that you could spray on your belongings and, and um, prove that they're yours, right? Um, and of course his, his joke is, well, what is stopping me from spraying it on your stuff and then calling the police? Um, he also talks about how you know, people who are adversarial thinking thinkers, you know, when they walk into a store, they think, well, oh, I could totally shoplift if I did this, or how could I vote twice, and, and so on. Um, other people talk about adversarial thinking as um, makers versus breakers. Um, and um, a couple of the uh, ideas there are things like, you know, printing your own barcodes. Once you realize that barcodes are just a, uh, they're not a security device, right? They're an identifier um things like that and you know when i talk to my students i say um you know don't think about how this how you're trying to make this work or do a particular thing but think about how can it fail think about what input would cause us to do something unexpected right what are the things that i'm not looking at what's the background versus the foreground the netflix prize paper is something that's mentioned as a example of adversarial thinking and for those of you who are unfamiliar with that, that was a big deal back when I was in grad school. Netflix had a, a big contest for um, uh, giving a better recommendation algorithm. And so they provided a bunch of de-anonymized data and some researchers instead said, oh, I bet I can de-anonymize some of these people. And so they, they worked on doing that. And so it's a great paper. Um, there's an XKCD for everything, of course. Um, here it is, it doesn't really matter how good your crypto is if um, I can just beat the password out of someone, right? Next slide, please. Other people talk about um, asking what if questions. What if this happened? What if that wasn't true? What if this constraint didn't hold? Um, uh, another example that we all, all learned about, hopefully not the hard way, but is locking a bike the right way, right? You don't just lock the front wheel, okay? Because if you do, they're going to steal the rest of the bike, which is actually the expensive part of the bike, right? So you lock it through the frame. Um, Tempest, the, the CIA um, signals project, uh, where if you don't know about Tempest, you should go read about it. You know, somebody had the bright idea of saying, hey, if I point an antenna at an electric typewriter, can I figure out what's being uh, typed? And the answer is yes. Um, and... Uh, I found a presentation from Steve Checkaway, um, who had a bunch of great photos of, of gates without fences or, or a zip tied, uh, but padlocked chain, right? Um, it's sort of soft security, right? Um, so do people have other examples, um, ready examples in their minds of, of, uh, what they think of as examples of adversarial thinking? Um, yeah, so Alan says chess. Go ahead. Lock picking. Lock picking. That's a really good one. Thank you. Um, and it's, there's no surprise that uh, a lot of computer security folks are into lock picking as a hobby, right? Um, okay, so I, I'm, uh, oh, and my last one, I know want my sticker. So I, I have some young kids and um, we were using stickers to get our children to, to do things because they were excited about it. And I, I said to my daughter, you know, honey, it was nighttime. You need to brush your teeth, you know, and she said no. And she sat down on the edge of the tub and I, I said, honey, if you don't brush your teeth, you know, um, you're going to lose your sticker. And she just looked at me and she put her, you know, uh, shook her head back and forth and said, I know want my sticker. And, and for me, it was like, she completely broke my system, right? I had nothing. I had no other recourse and a four-year-old or she was actually two or three at the time. She just saw right through that. Right. And said, well, oh, what if the penalty is worth it? Um, then, uh, the whole thing falls apart. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, so what about other, uh, I, I, I'm going to skip this slide, but, but here in the community view, um, I spent a bunch of time on this before, um, but the, the different definitions that people have come up with, I think the central idea here is identifying possibilities. Um, so let's, uh, next slide, please. What I'm doing right now is spending time looking at other views, right? So military, legal, political games, and so on. Um, Sun Tzu has already come up. Um, people haven't mentioned the, the idea of uh, the kill chain, um, you know, find, fix, uh, fire, and finish, that kind of thing. Um, and of course, um, that's an idea uh, that is, uh, has found use in cybersecurity as well, right? Uh, as well as the OODA loop, um, which is another similar idea of um, getting inside the process that people use to make decisions that's found um, purchase in both the legal and the military world. Um, what kinds of things does Machiavelli say about um, politics and thinking adversarially and so on? And in games, um, some of the reading I was doing recently, and I imagine I'll, I'll sit down and discuss with Dr. Sherman about this, but you know the difference between things like tactics in chess, which are possibilities in movement on the board versus deeper strategies in chess. Um, uh, next slide, please. So that's an active area for me. So what's special about cybersecurity? For me, I think the thing that people keep talking about that keeps coming up in my reading and work is the idea of seeing those possibilities, um, seeing possible moves that people could take. Um, and in the cyber world, there are just um, a lot fewer um, constraints and, and many fewer consequences, right? Um, you know, the laws, uh, yes, there are laws, but are people really going to be caught or prosecuted? Um, you know, especially if, let's say you're working for a, a foreign country, um, you know, no norms. Uh, it's sort of the true path of least resistance. If you can think about it, you can do it, and you're probably not even going get to get in trouble. Um, in other areas, so legal and military and so on, deception is often really critical. But that's not something that comes up often in, you know, when people talk about adversarial thinking in security as this like core concept. Um, obviously, deception is important in larger campaigns and so on, um, but it's not quite as um, critical in what I would call like first order or first level adversarial thinking. Um, and there are just no physical constraints in the same way as in these other areas, right? Um, you can try things a million times, um, and if it works one time, then you win, right? Or from a thousand different IP addresses, uh, so on and so forth. Um, these constraints don't exist in the same way in uh, the military or law or uh, politics and so on. Um, I'm just looking at the, the chat here. Um, desire paths is a great, uh, I like that idea. Uh, K1 Tia, uh, so actually one of the previous slides shows desire paths around a constraint, right? Um, and desire paths in general are, you know, when you see that corner worn off of the grass because people don't want to walk around on the sidewalk, uh, that's a great idea. Um, all right, uh, I'm, I am running out of time. So um, moving forward, um, next slide. Again, I'm focusing on ideas of unique moves with potential benefits. Um, and uh, how can we do testing for this in particular? How can we do testing for this um, in a non-technical sense? Next slide, please. So for me, I'm interested in doing it non-technically um, because what I'd like to be able to do is um, ask these questions of everyday people, right? Um, give these questions to lawyers and to uh, military strategists and to English majors and musicians and security students and see who demonstrates um, these abilities. Um, now, I don't think the right way to do this is through multiple choice tests. So uh, the CATS project has done multiple choice um, for their concept inventory, and I'm working on a multiple choice test about security misconceptions. But one of the challenges with multiple choice for security is that in so many cases, um, when you see the right answer or the, the vulnerability or the obvious mistake or something, 
it suddenly becomes obvious. You didn't see it before, but once you are aware of its existence, it's suddenly obvious. Um, and so I think in adversarial thinking, it'd be really challenging to write multiple choice questions that um, get at these ideas without being sort of very cagey about it. Um, and so what I'm looking at right now is doing open-ended questions um, where where um, participants can provide multiple answers and those answers are graded based on how unusual or surprising is it how practical is it how likely is it to achieve the goal um, and then scoring tests that way and the way that i'm uh, the approach i'm i'm investigating right now is using uh, the idea of lateral thinking puzzles which are kind of like um, you know those locked room puzzles you might have have done uh, where people say, oh, there's a person dead in the room and the door's locked and what happened? And you have to answer yes or no questions to, to get your way towards the answer. There's a fantastic podcast called Futility Closet um, and they do lateral thinking puzzles at the end of each uh, episode. It's, it's really great. Um, but instead of, you know, we're not gonna have a back and forth in this test. Instead, I'm interested in providing scenarios that have a potential application for adversarial thinking, and then seeing how many possible answers um, people can generate and evaluate those answers that way. So um, that's why I wanted to um, get through the slides because I'd actually like to give everyone a challenge. Um, and, and what I'd like you to do, uh, uh, Dr. Sherman, if you could switch to the next slide, um, get out a, a, you know, notepad document or something here. And um, what I'd like you to do is think about this scenario and write down as many possible uh, ways you can think of that will allow someone to benefit um, by speeding and not getting caught. So here's the scenario. Uh, a town has an automated speed trap on Main Street. The system consists of two computerized cameras uh, on Main. One takes a picture of license plates as they drive into town, and the other takes uh, does the same as they leave town. Um, you can assume this clarification isn't in here. You can assume that there's um, bi-directional cameras at each end of town. It includes the data uh, exact time it was taken, the picture of the, the bumper. Uh, and if not enough time has passed between the two pictures, the registered owner of the car will get an automatic speeding ticket with the fine automatically adjusted based on the speed from the elapsed time. So how many different ways can you think of that would allow someone to speed on Main Street, not get caught and benefit from doing so? So uh, let's just take a couple minutes, maybe three minutes to think about that and write down um, the different uh, ways you can think of uh, that people could do that. How many lanes is Main Street? We'll say that it's two lanes, one lane in each direction. Okay. But uh, if you need clarifications, um, I just encourage you to um, uh, just pick it up, right? So um, part of the idea here is, you know, I'm not telling you who made the computers, what kind of megapixels the cameras are. You know, you here's your scenario. And based on that scenario, what can you think of? Uh, I've set a little timer here, so so I'll watch that, and um, everybody just try to think of as many possibilities as you can. I'll give you about one more minute. Oh. 
And I try one one way you can avoid getting caught. Um, what was the question? I said uh, I, I'm thinking of about one way he, uh, someone can avoid uh, getting a ticket while speeding at the main street. Yes, that's um, that's exactly the challenge. But let's wait. Uh, well, we're, we're pretty much at time, so um, I'll just stop the clock and let's talk about possibilities. I see people are, are putting things in the, uh, the chat. That's great, too. I probably won't be able to uh, keep up with them quickly enough, but um, Faro, is that, I, I'm not sure how to say your name. Um, yeah, that's, that's fine. Faro, uh, what, what was your idea? So my idea is a, a person can arrive to the town, drive as fast as he could, but if, if he he make a, any stop, the time lapse will be will not match the speed. So still, he can speed on the main street and not get caught. So if I understand uh, your suggestion is, you know, I call this the speed to lunch solution, right? right? So I I'm late for my meeting. I speed. I get to the restaurant in town. I take a long lunch, and then I speed out of town, and the elapsed time um, means that. It, the system doesn't think I was speeding. Right. Um, great. I love that answer. Uh, other answers that people had? I have a, a few um, in varying degrees of nastiness. nastiness. Um, uh, let's let's take your favorite one, and then we'll we'll go back around. Mm, that's hard. Um, can I do one real and then my favorite one? Sure. Okay. So there's one one that I actually know of that. That actually works as far as I can tell. Um, and it works with motorcycles. What you do is you bend the license plate out slightly um, as if like it was broken. Um, so it's pointing slightly up and the cameras can't detect it that way. And so you can speed. Hmm. Um, so cool. that's a real one. Um, and the false one is to, or the one to make it, my favorite one is to get a translucent display um, that can block out your license plate, hit a button and make the display display your uh, nasty neighbor's license plate instead and then they can get the ticket uh, so i like that i like both of those right um the 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 bend the plate one um is sort of like a, a um adversarial it reminds me of adversarial machine learning right it's like i bend the plate so that people can see it and maybe the police officer uh in town won't think that i'm doing anything um but the camera will fail to read it correctly um i like that one um and the the display someone else's plate, you know, that solution um, is similar to steal a neighbor's uh, license plate or, you know, um, color in some of your existing plate or, or whatever. So that's also a really great valid solution. Um, and I should say I have a list here of um, 35, now 36 um, unique ways of doing this um, because I didn't have the, the bend the plate one. Um, and I'm going to call that a unique one. Um, so what blew me away is the amount of different kinds of potential attacks. So, uh, anybody else want to share some potential attacks? I have a fairly uninspired one. I wouldn't mind sharing. Great. Keep a bat, keep a bat in your car's trunk, stop next to the camera, retrieve the bat, eliminate the camera. Right. So destroy the camera, right? So shoot the camera, bat the camera. I've uh, seen people spray paint the lens spray paint the lens and, and it, well the you constraint know, was not to get caught or in trouble so a simpler version of that is just tape over the lens sure and and so if i were grading these on a rubric right i might say yes this would work but um you know functionally it would work but you're more likely to get caught and so probably uh less um less good of an answer for those um, other other answers. I'm sensitive to the fact that some people need to go, um, but I don't have a specific cons time constraint. Yeah, I, I have, have a suggestion. Uh, you could uh, put the plate in the back window of your car. Uh, sometimes that's done, you know, for one reason or another, and it's likely that the um, automated system wouldn't find it. Yes. Um, Yes, absolutely. So I, I have done this exercise with my students. Um, that's a great one. Um, and the one, the thing that reminded me 
of that answer from the student's answer is um, temporary tags, right? So um, act like you just got the car from a dealer. Um, and so you've got temp tags in the window, but those probably aren't going to get picked up. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, giving these other versions of your attacks um, in any way to devalue the attacks, but um, to as examples of there are classes of answers to this. Uh, attack they want to share EMP EMP that's very a great one very illegal but uh it'll, it'll break it <laughs> and and that to me is the the that's thinking adversarially because you just dropped a bit the last word you, uh, you're also muted now Oh, somehow it auto auto muted me. Okay, that's weird. Uh, that's thinking way outside the box, and and I like that a lot, right? Um, EMP, that's great. Uh, other other examples. I like that Nithia. would also probably knock out the town. <laughs> Nithia, well, you can do directional EMPs. Okay. Um, but uh, Nithia. I think that's how you pronounce it. Said steal an ambulance and use that way. Oh, is, I mean, what are they gonna do? It's an ambulance. Awesome. I, okay, it's thirty-seven. Uh, that is amazing. <laughs> See, I I love that. I love asking people this question. Um, that's amazing. Uh, anybody else? It's overly complex, but you could attack the software of the system, or you could attack the people, like bribe somebody in the office that issues the fines. Yep. Yes. I like the tape better. Um, hack, hack the computer that controls Another the system. Another right? one that I had thought of was to make it uh, have a like a dash cam that it's recording your speed. And make a some sort of apparatus to make the device think you're going faster than you are. So you do get hit by the speed ticket, mm. and then you sue the city for messing it up, and you show them the ed evidence, and you get money for it. That would be interesting. That's a a different attack, um, but a great idea, right? If you had your buddy, let's say your buddy had the the fake, um, you know, uh, e paper license plate, they could. Um, enter town right away and then you could lazily drive out of town um, you know at the other end of town and, and your elapsed time could be like one second um, interesting other ideas so uh, I'll share a couple of my favorites um, one thing that no one mentioned is um, enter town in the in the middle or leave town by a side road um, I, uh, drive at the speed of light so that your car literally cannot be seen. Um, <laughs> drive, these are way I out there, but I think professor Sherman, uh, mentioned that one, that there's a certain speed, which you can drive at. Oh, I, that I, I, I did. And, oh, I didn't see that in the chat. Other people typed in the first suggestion. I, I noted that, um, the TV program Mythbusters actually had a scientific experiment on how fast you have to go so the cameras can't see you. And the awesome. answer is it, it has to be um, uh, one of these jet cars uh, <laughs> that, that go like over 500 miles an hour. I don't remember <laughs> the exact um, speed, but it, it's uh, dri driving an Indy 500 race car is not fast enough. Yeah, I like that. Um, I think my favorite answer that I've ever gotten is uh, drive backwards in the opposing lane, get a negative elapsed time, and get a check in the mail from um, the city, uh, which of course is would not probably work. But uh, to me, that's thinking about um, different components. Okay, um, so. Again, I don't have any constraints, but I want to try to wrap up the talk a little bit, and then I'm happy to hang around. Um, next slide, please. So we've talked about answers that, that people have provided, and, and thank you for those. Um, again, not happy to stick around and chat. 
Um, some of them are definitely new answers to me. Um, so thank you very much. You know, I, I'm now pushing like 40 kind of unique classes of answers. Um, so what do you think? Do you think this is an example of adversarial thinking that would be relevant to the kind of adversarial thinking we do in computer security? Yes or no, what do you think? The only argument against that I would have is the practicality of using uh, this sort of approach to screw over a, a speeding camera. <laughs> but other than that, like the thinking uh, aspect of it absolutely is is great. Um, who, who disagrees? Who thinks this is not um, an example of the kind of mental processes that we um, use for cybersecurity? I'm not saying it's every aspect, right? But is this an example? Um, or if it isn't, why not? There were too many silly things in there that should not be a part of cyber adversarial thinking. Don't underestimate the power of silly. <laughs> I absolutely agree um, that many of those answers are, are silly. Um, but I guess I would say their answers on the way towards um, picking a good answer that you, that a person might actually try. But yes, uh, of course, some of them are just completely absurd. A silly or um, unlikely to succeed answer would get a low score. Right. Or, or maybe it would get, you know, a medium score if it's just so creative, right, that, that it, it gets a bump in that direction, but it, it's not an uh, all-rounder type of an answer. There is an aspect of adversarial thinking that I think is important that I don't think you you mentioned, which is I think th there is an assumption that that there's some uh, context where uh, one party is trying to do something, um, and the adversarial thinking very much has to do with uh, trying to defeat that person from achieving their objective, which. And there, there might also be a separate objective of the adversary, and these objectives may collide. Hmm. And exactly what it means might depend a little bit on the context. Yes. I mean, for, for example, you can find some military papers, uh, like certain types of incident reporting that, that claim to be addressing some part of adversarial thinking, and they have a template for what you should find about each of these incidents. Hmm. I'd love to see those. Um, yeah, and I, I appreciate that. And I, I certainly am not at the point in my process where I would say, I don't believe this is all that there is to adversarial thinking, but um, uh, one aspect of it. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, other... Uh, why is it so comments? hard for people to come up with a definition? I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it if it is hard, um, but people haven't really tried. Um, and for me, as a, a person who is interested in research in this area and wants to move the ball forward. Um, I think any kind of, the, the problem is getting from a definition to a widely accepted definition. Um, and, and if it's not widely accepted, then it's not going to be as useful for um, research. Um, you know, uh, so again, I don't think that it's impossible to, to come up with a definition, but I think it may be more um, practical to identify components that are sort of unarguably adversarial thinking as a step towards coming up with uh, a definition, right? If we come up with five things that are that everyone agrees are adversarial thinking and we can't come up with anything else beyond that scope, then maybe we're prepared to come up with a definition that, that people will actually agree with. But I don't know. Um, other questions or comments? Um, so, 
for me, one of the reasons that I like this type of problem is it it's a problem that I could give to anyone, you know, with sort of high school English, um, you know, reading and life skills, right? Um, and so the other problems that I've been looking at are all sort of in of that character. And so I will say too, if any of you think can think of similar problems or similar open-ended type of scenarios, I would love to hear from you about that um, because I'm always on the hunt. Um, I buy puzzle books and I just flip through them looking for ones where I don't need to know what the answer is. I need a problem where I can come up with 40 different potential answers. I think can you the... say more about um, how you plan to judge the quality of open-ended responses and how difficult will it be to, to grade these answers? Yeah, so um, again, the, the idea that I'm working on, and I think if you go back to, um, well, it's slide 24 on, on Google Sheets. Oh, it's the previous slide. Oh, you got it. Um, is the idea of uh, a multidimensional rubric. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm asking this same question to a lot of people is to try to see, is there kind of a, a finite list of common solutions to this. Um, and you can use that list as a way of um, training graders or identifying, you know, what are the more common or less common solutions. Um, the education person I've been working with on this process says that, you know, in general, her experience at least is that after people have seen a number or a, a, enough of enough responses to questions, um, answers tend to fall into bins pretty naturally. And that um, graders, if they understand how other people are doing the grading, can grade fairly consistently, consistently, right? So it's similar. I mean, the, the problem is that, you know, multiple choice is great. It grades instantly and it's completely objective. Um, the problem with a test like this is that it's open-ended and so you might think, oh, it's just a free for all. Alan's going to grade this way and I'm going to grade that way. Um, but if we've actually run the question with a large enough group of people ahead of time, we have a pretty good idea of what kinds of answers are going to come out and where we believe that they fall um, based on grading by experts. Um, and so a grader would need to be trained essentially, um, but it would be trained based on previous answers. Can you re repeat and remind us what are the dimensions of grading, like um, creativity, practicality, cost, uh, risk, or what are the categories? Yeah, so if you, I think on the next slide, um, I'm not sure exactly what those categories will be ultimately. Um, so it's, yep, uh, go previous, just one after the speed, one before the speed trap. So, for example, things like how surprising or un unique or unusual is this answer, right? Um, and uh, how practical is this answer? Like, would this answer actually, is this something you could actually do, right? Um, versus how likely is it to achieve the goal, right? So driving the car at the speed of light is not practical, right? But it would work if you could do it, right? Um, and it's you know, fairly surprising, but it's not the most surprising answer, right? So people usually bring it up. Um, and so this is just one example. Um, another way that um, my education person has talked about is maybe grading based on the sophistication uh, of the um, of the answer. So if you look at things like, um, you know, knowledge, analysis, synthesis, uh, that kind of level, you might be able to grade answers based on kind of how sophisticated the reasoning is that goes into the answer. Um, this is still an open uh, question for me. And what I'm trying to do is um, uh, try out different ways of doing the grading um, with people to see what seems to, to match um, my ideas of adversarial thinking. But then obviously I would um, include a, a panel of experts to help do this grading and you know, um, make sure that they agree with the outcome. So it would be a list of things. And so one list would be, uh, what are the uh, 
results that the attacker, that the cyber attacker is looking for. That would be one of the interesting lists. Yes. Do you have a study design in mind? And for example, would you also give the subjects an IQ test? Uh, often in psychology to interpret human answers, they, they want to know in context to some standard measurements of intellect. Um, that's a great question um, that I haven't thought about. So um, the study design I had been thinking about is similar to what the CATS project has done. So pilot testing individual questions um, and, you know, doing um, think aloud interviews and then doing validation. Um, but the idea of comparing to some other standardized test uh, could be actually really interesting. Um, in particular, I mean, IQ tests are sort of controversial, but it would be interesting to know um, how uh, or to what extent IQ correlates with performance on this test. Hey, Peter, it's Linda. Um, Hi, Linda. Hi. I wondered if you've often thought about um, Torrance's test on creativity. Um, is that something that you looked at or considered? Um, no, but I'm writing it down because um, that's a great idea. There, There's obviously um, a big connection between the idea of creativity and the kinds of thinking that, that I asked all of you to do here. Um, and... Yeah. It's also interesting because the way they score it is, um, so for example, the classic question is, you know, what can you use a paperclip for? And, and you look at their responses in terms of the fluency, how many they come up with, um, the um, flexibility, how many categories um, of uses have they come up with? Yeah. And also um, the um, originality, did they come up with something that no one yeah. else thought of? So that might be something to consider, you know, as a, another tool. I love that. Um, thank you. Another uh, kind of on the same ballpark, uh, a question I've thought about asking people um, is Dunker's candle problem. Are you you're familiar with that, Linda? Uh, yes, yes. Um, if, if people aren't familiar with it, I don't know, somehow have someone um, ask it to you in an unspoiled way. Um, I'm, I'll put it in the chat. Dunker's candle problem um, have a friend ask you unspoiled um, it's a really interesting creative thinking um, thinking about moves and possibilities in a constrained space um, with v everyday items that i think is great um, but that you what you were telling me about the the creativity test reminds me of that um, thank you other comments questions Ideas? Well, I really want to thank you all for um, listening to me uh, talk today. Uh, like I said, it, it's a, a work in progress, um, but it's something I'm really excited about, and I think it's fun um, and relevant to our work. Um, so once again, thank you to, to Alan and, and everyone else here. Thank you all for coming, and um, I really appreciate it. You can always reach out to me. My email address is on the slides. I will put the slide um, URL back in the chat. Um, you can also Google for me. And thank you, Dr. Peterson. It is our pleasure. And as always, we will post the video of the talk on the UMBC uh, Cybersecurity Center webpage. Great. Thank you so much. In two weeks, we have our final talk, which is one of my PhD, will be by one of my PhD students, Farah Javani, and he's going to be talking about how you can build an anonymous communication system using oblivious transfer. Uh, transfer. Okay, this this ends this meeting of the Cyber Defense Lab. Bye. Great, thank you. <laughs>